Good morning. Welcome back to Morning at 10 TV. My name is Malaki Villaudera. Now today on the solution segment, we'll be focusing on the water and sewerage systems in the country. I'm sure you've been having this question. So remember the hashtag is Morning at 10 TV. That's on Twitter. You can also stream us live and drop in your comments and TV Uganda. That's on Facebook and YouTube as well. And so for you to be able to get your questions answered in studio i have engineer dominic Cavutse. thank you so much for joining us he is the commissioner urban water supply and sewerage department in the ministry of water and environment thank you so much for joining us sir thank you and good morning good morning we also have mr gilbert biamugisha who is the manager central umbrella and water sanitation authority still from the ministry of water and environment good morning sir good morning to you you're thank welcome you. to the show mm -hmm. Just for us to understand the major role, you know, of this umbrella authorities in the Ministry of Water and Environment, we all know just for us to, you know, access water, have, you know, functioning sewerage systems, there's an entire team behind the scenes just yesterday and actually this whole week you have been on ground ensuring that that is in place in the different regions in the country. Just get us to understand what exactly it is that you do. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mara for giving us an opportunity to tell the, the country the role of the Ministry of Water and Environment in the provision of water and sewage services in this country. One, the ministry is quite large. It also has other uh, functions which include environment protection uh, and then also forestry services mm -hmm. apart from water supply. But also within water supply, we have uh, other subsectors like water for production, which is responsible for providing water for agricultural use, for livestock, for fishing, and so on and so forth. Then we've got another segment, the rural water supply and, uh, and, and, and sanitation uh, services, which mainly deals with the people living in rural areas in open agricultural settlements. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of services that we offer in the Ministry of Water and Environment. It's a, a key ministry. As far as the water and sewage services are concerned in this country, we are mainly looking at the water supply services in the large towns like Kampara, mm -hmm. uh, Jinja, Entebbe. Then we also have got another segment of towns, what we call the small towns and rural growth centers. Mm -hmm. These are the towns with the populations between 5,000 people to 10,000 people. Small towns like Kamudin, like, uh, like Chazanga. Those are the type of small towns that we are talking about. Um, so our responsibility is mainly in the small towns and rural growth centers. Okay. And uh, while the National Water and Storage Corporation is responsible for the large towns, like Kampara and and Entebbe. Okay. So that's what we are doing. And for us here, um, also within that small towns, again, we have got two main portfolio functions. One is the development function, where we, um, we, 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 we construct, we plan, uh, design, develop, and construct water supply systems, piped water supply systems, for those towns, small towns, and rural growth centers. Okay. Then there is also the operational maintenance, which is sort of decentralized to the umbrella authorities that the ministry has created. So it is not the ministry directly, but the water authorities that have been formed to manage the, the systems I exactly in the same way the National Water and Storage Corporation manages Kampara City. Okay, and we we'll also get into that because I know also the major conversation that we're trying to have today is how these systems can now be maintained as well mm -hmm. by the people using them. Mr. Gilbert, um, let's talk about water and sanitation um, in the country and of course we've been seeing this uh, a few weeks ago we were having a discussion with one of the big hospitals here that has been struggling with sewage sewage systems and sanitation as well um, and of course uh, residents in that area um, of course this is something that I know the ministry is looking into but why were you were we seeing ourselves getting to that point whereby it's our entire hospital that we know uses water on an hourly basis, a lot of water, and yet there's lack of, you know, proper systems for sewerage and sanitation. 
Would we say that we can attribute that to maybe poor planning when it comes to construction of these hospitals or maintenance? Uh, of course, on the, on the part of the hospitals, it is, uh, I would say, it would be part of the planning of the hospital to see that uh, there is a provision for, for handling sewage services. But even then, for such a bigger town, when you're planning, mm -hmm. it means that uh, you have to put in place uh, a system where it is connected to a bigger sewer line and then it is managed at that level mm -hmm. uh, for a specific uh, hospital or maybe they have what would call uh, um, their own treatment system as a hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See that uh, the issue of the sewerage services is, uh, is addressed. I, I, I can add yes. something on yeah. that, uh -huh, uh -huh. on the roles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where does the role of the Ministry of Water and Environment come in when it comes to sewage services in the hospital right. mm -hmm. or even to other institutions. Our role is mainly to provide the basic infrastructure, that is the pipelines that will drain the sewage from the institutions up to where it is supposed to be treated. Then the hospital or the other institution is supposed to do the plumbing systems the, the, the within their institution mm -hmm. and then they connect. To, 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 to our systems. Yes. Now, at times there is a, a, a disconnect where either we have got our pipelines laid, but the developers of the hospital, which is normally another arm of government, mm -hmm. does not necessarily make a provision for connecting on our, on our network. And uh, therefore, you find there is that disconnect. But there also the other disconnect could be that our sewage network has not yet reached the, the hospital that uh, has been constructed. Mm -hmm. But in that case, then we, 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 we recommend that a, a, a mini treatment works for that to drain that hospital is created. Okay. That's what we normally uh, advise. Before we actually get to the recommendation, um, before a hospital is constructed, yeah. when they tell you we have a plan to construct X ox hospital, yeah. don't you come in and also advise on what should happen, on what systems will work out when it comes mm -hmm. to sewerage systems, and also be there to inspect the process of constructing that hospital mm -hmm. together with the entire finishing process just for that hospital to have, you know, clear and well-operating sewerage systems. You are right. That is our role as a, a technical ministry responsible for sewerage. Then why do we so have we that do that. But I will tell you that in most of the cases that we have in this country, that one has been done. We have been in contact with the, the institutions that are developing their infrastructure right. to advise them on how to create mini uh, sewerage systems. And when you go to most of the upcountry uh, hospitals, say you go to uh, to 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 to, to Bushen, you go to to Itojo, you mm -hmm. go to Weya, Mtungamo, mm -hmm. all these uh, hospitals have those mini schemes. Mm -hmm. Then I've got a big hospital like Murabu, which is connected on the sewer network of, 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 Kampala, of Kampala City. Mm -hmm. So that is how we, 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 we work together. And it's working. We are doing very well. And it's working. Yeah. Okay, we've seen you um, this week be very active in the small towns in the country. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, we've also seen you working with such, um, with this particular company. Of course, you can't mention names because of advertising issues. Um, you're just putting in, in, into place also solar systems mm -hmm. for, you know, engines to run, for the pumping of water to happen. Tell us a little bit more about that. Why are you now focusing as well in the small towns, especially in the rural areas? Mm -hmm. Now, that is the development function, uh, the construction function that I talked about. Okay. Indeed, a lot of work is going on. I can tell you that as I, we talk today, we are carrying out construction work in some 55 towns across the country. Mm -hmm. 55 towns with different technologies. Uh, and every year, we commission about 25 towns every year, which we commission to the, to the population. And also tell you that uh, since 1986, we have commissioned, the, the government has uh, constructed over 1,200 piped water systems in, in the towns. That's what uh, we have done. Okay. Now, the innovations that you are talking about are very critical. For example, you, you have noticed that you have been installing solar systems, right. solar power. Now, solar power is so important because, one, it is the most cost-effective uh, source of energy when, say, compared 
to diesel or to electricity. It is the cheapest, meaning that our tariffs can be kept very low. Uh, we can talk about the tariffs also at some appropriate time. Yes. Mm -hmm. But this technology has helped us to keep the tariffs so low. And I'll tell you that where we have got, for example, that those solar, we are selling a jerrican of water on, at 20 shillings only. While if you don't have the solar, then the jerrican of water will cost about 50 shillings. So essentially what yes. you're saying is uh, residents in these areas will have to pay to access this water. Yes. Tell us more about that, Mr. Gilbert. Um, given that, of course, um, in the rural setting now, for people to say that we're going to have to pay for us to access this water, are they embracing that aspect of them having to pay to access the water? Why mm. did you have to put a cost factor to it? Yeah, of course the cost factor aspect was to, to meet the operation and maintenance costs okay. of running these systems and even to some smaller extent even have some capital development and expansion of these systems. But in carrying out this function, the Ministry of Water and Environment actually uh, mandated this role to the umbrella of water and sanitation authorities that are uh, in this country. There are six water and sanitation authorities in the country covering the different regions of the country. Mm -hmm. But in this area where we are in, we are under the central umbrella of water and sanitation authority, which I personally head, mm -hmm. and uh, the office is in Wakiso that the region office of the Ministry of Water and Environment. Uh, like I've said, it is uh, the mandate of the ministry to see that the population gets clean and safe water. And they have now entrusted this role to the umbrella organization, the umbrella authority that I've talked about. Mm -hmm. There are two aspects the umbrella authority is looking at. One is the day-to-day -day operation and maintenance of the of the piped water systems, and secondly, do some capital development to see that the population continues to be served. Because where you stop after the capital development, the system should always expand to continue and serve the, the, the communities okay. where that are supposed to be served. Let me ask you a question. With all these systems in place and you even expanding still um, to other parts of the country, outside Kampala, outside the big towns, um, then why are we still seeing some areas in Kampala and these big towns lacking water, mm. which is a basic commodity for survival? Mm. Mr. Um, Engineer Dominic, you can take that. <coughs> okay. As he, as he has said, you can construct a water supply system now but you know the population of these urban centers is rapidly expanding. Mm -hmm. The population in urban centers is expanding at a rate of 5.8% per year, right. although the national average is 3.2%. So in the, in, in the urban areas, including Kampala, it is rapid, very mm -hmm. rapid. Mm -hmm. So what we experience is that uh, the facilities that we have constructed to supply are being surpassed, the demand is surpassing the capacity of the investments that we have constructed. Take the example of Kampala City. Kampala City is growing very rapidly. Right. These facilities were constructed some time back, but they are constructed once, but the population is increasing every year. But what the government has done, we also have a program for continuous expansion in the urban areas. It can never stop. You can't say that I've constructed a water system and now I have finished. You can't right, finish. Right. So right now, for example, the case of Kampara, mm -hmm. the ministry through the National Water Storage Corporation is constructing a new water treatment plant at Katosi. Mm -hmm. You may have heard it. Yes. And with this treatment plant, the, the water in Kampara, for example, is likely to double the, the amount of water available. Okay. And then definitely the areas that are not getting water today, most likely, Will it be will it start receiving water? When will they expect this to actually happen? Okay, the contracts have been signed. Okay. So we expect that uh, within a period of three years from today, the, this uh, water treatment plant at Katosi and the transmission lines 
bring water to Kampala okay. will be completed. All right. Let's mm -hmm. talk um, about also another pertinent issue that we've been seeing dominating the headlines, and this is the battle between you know residents and NEMA. Mm -hmm. um, then just trying to put off people from you know water catchment areas. What's your take on this, and why do we leave the situation to get to a point whereby we let people settle mm -hmm. in water catchment areas, and then we allow it to happen, allow them to settle in and then come and throw them away. Why don't we have guidelines and policies that protect this environment? Mm. Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, and I think uh, the public uh, should be informed that uh, the Minister of Water and Environment, our mandate is also to protect these uh, ecosystems, these uh, areas that are fragile, the areas that uh, um, where the the wetlands are situated, mm -hmm. the lakes and the rivers. It's the mandate of the Minister of Water and Environment. Right. But of course, as you have asked, you find a situation whereby, although it's a protected area, it's a no-go area for development, but the developers are always hunting for, for areas where to put their developments. And unfortunately, either through ignorance or through what, they, they, we find them putting a lot of pressure on these on these wetlands, wanting to construct uh, uh, businesses, they are homes and residential homes and so on and so forth. Yes. Now, from our side, we try our level best to stop the, the process, but at times we also face challenges like the, the the absolute pressure that the the investor is putting on. Also, coordination, say with our sister agencies, where, for example, you may find that you have a wetland, but you find that there is a land title which has been should so pretty in, much in you're saying the challenge has been corruption well the challenges are i would say coordination mm -hmm. you find that the one issuing around the title into a wetland may not even know that actually there is a wetland here how don't they know how don't they know i thought we have clear policies that protect this water catchment mm -hmm. areas this you know wetlands in the country now of course that's where now government needs we need to come in as government mm -hmm. and and coordinate amongst ourselves so that we guide the development process. But as I've said, the pressure for land is so high that at times they overwhelm the, the planning. Of course, the physical planning is in place, but the, now there is the issue of surveillance, mm -hmm. making sure that the areas remain protected, enforcement of the roads. These are the areas that we need to, to, to tighten as a government so that the areas remain protected. But of course, in some extreme cases, like uh, recently, Government has had to issue a directive for people to leave the wetlands. Yes. And in some areas, uh, they have also given a directive to cancel the land titles that were erroneously issued in such uh, protected areas. Let's talk about, and I think Mr. Gilbert, you can, um, you know, take on this one. Um, let's talk about the issue of, you know, licenses being awarded to contractors and developers who actually move ahead and build, you know, buildings in riparian land. How does it get to that point? Um, of course, um, the, the license, the, 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 the ones given by the National Environment Management Authority. First of all, for, for any development to be done, then you must do what we call an environmental impact assessment. Right. And once it is done, the guidelines are put in place on how, it should, on how, that, on how to mitigate any, any negative effects on that project. And if the, the developer shows commitment that he's going to fulfill that, then at that level maybe is given a license to do the development. So uh, under the our our sister organization, the National Environment Management Authority, mm -hmm. uh, of course development has to take place, but with the specific guidelines that must be followed and they should be well stipulated in the license. So would you say that still would attribute this fact that you're seeing developers, you know, developing wetlands and repairing land to the disconnect between government agencies where, because I'm thinking the ideal situation would be before a license is actually awarded to a developer, then your team and the team that has been mandated by government mm -hmm. to protect this environment, to just go inspect and once you've given a go-ahead, then they're issued the license. But things seem to go the other way around. The 
license is issued and then now you come and try to have that battle between you know the agencies why are we seeing that disconnect and when will it ever end because we know um, the environment plays a major role if our children and our children's children are to have a great environment to survive in in the future then this has to be taken care of now mm. y you are right madam the environment is extremely very important for the survival of uh, the present generations but more importantly for the future generations right mm. so it is our duty really to protect uh, this environment i think the issue of coordination is improving and that's why I've told you that, for example, recently the government issued a directive for people to leave the wetlands, mm -hmm. and in some cases, even the land titles were, were cancelled. Mm -hmm. So the, the coordination is improving. Then, of course, also the other issue which has happened in the government is that the, a, a, a special uh, police force has been, um, ha has been delegated to work on a full-time basis on the protection of the of the of the environment protection of the wetlands the forests and so on and so forth mm -hmm. anything including the utilities by the way right. like the small towns are talking about we we get cases of vandalism of the of the infrastructure in the in, in the small towns so this police force is also there to protect that infrastructure so i would say that the ministry and the, the our, our mandate to protect is is continuously improving and mm -hmm. the government is uh, is supporting us okay. of course i've said they have given us a, a police force um, which is part of the police but with full-time uh, uh, responsibility right. to protect uh, the environment and of course also the the, the resourcing the, the financing there is now a budget in the ministry uh, and also in NEMA and also in the national forest authority mm -hmm. for purposes of facilitating this policing of the of, of the environment so it is it is improving but on small towns let me also say this yes we, we have been having cases of vandalism where people go and 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 uproot our pipes others they they steal the fittings these fittings i mean the valves uh, the gate valves and the washout valves mm. they are very expensive uh, generally speaking uh, and they are, they are they are large diameter valves right so we have been having cases of vandalism and i want to appeal to the public that uh, protecting this infrastructure should be everybody's business because ultimately who loses it is the people living in those small towns that uh, that that, that lose the service so i want right. to appeal to the public to protect this infrastructure make sure when we put in place it's not vandalize it mm -hmm. but also that's how the tariff will really keep low for example in a, uh, many in the mountain er uh, er areas right. we have got gravity flow schemes a jelly can of water is only 20 shillings only 20 shillings mm -hmm. i'm sure everybody can, uh, can afford, afford that, that yes. including the, the village person okay in fact in some areas like uh, we have got some special groups of people like uh, in, uh, in in kanungu mm -hmm. and so we have got the the Batwa people these are people who who are still in a state of uh, under development okay we even give them free water free water but generally speaking a jerkin is about 20 shillings okay but uh, unless we protect these assets then it's not possible for the for the umbrella authority to deliver this water at 20 shillings okay all right so i want to appeal to the people to protect these assets these systems yeah. all right okay as we come to a close what are your closing remarks i think we can start with mr gilbert and come to you engineer mm. yeah thank you thank you so much uh, of course uh, my closing remarks is that uh, of course as the uh, as the umbrella of water and sanitation authority uh, our rule being that we have to ensure that uh, the <coughs> people get clean and safe water in the small towns rural growth centers will continue to do that okay. and also continue to see that these systems are expanded to serve more and more people within the different parts of the country. Okay. Thank you. Engineer, I'd like you to also yeah. point out to what you're doing with the fight of corruption. 
in mm. the ministry and just protecting the environment. One minute. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, definitely it's a continuous process. Yes. As I've said, we have a special police force, mm. but we also have developed guidelines, policies, and, and regulations okay. which are helping us. But allow me to, uh, to, to make an appeal to the public outside there that please pay your water bills because that's the only way we shall keep the system functioning. And then lastly, mm -hmm. also to inform the public that the ministry has a, still has a big job to do mm -hmm. because in the whole country we have over about, about 1,500 towns that we have identified but do not have piped water systems. Okay. They are still virgin. Mm -hmm. And of these, 15 of them are district headquarters. We have to find money to do this. Right. Then we have got what we call gazetted town councils, mm -hmm. urban councils. Mm -hmm. 75 of them do not have piped water. Then we have got what we call town boards. Uh, 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 180 of those boards. Don't also have water. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then we have got rural growth centers. About 800 of them, they also don't have water. So our, our, the task is still is still big okay. and and i want to assure the, the, the ugandans that the ministry of water and environment has and the government has put in a strategy to ensure that everybody is reached has the water supply oh, right. by the year 2030. By the year 2030. Yes. We'll mm. hold you accountable for that promise uh, yes. 2030 will <laughs> also, you know, follow up with that and bring you here to answer those questions mm. on whether you would have attained that or not and why. Mm. Okay, that has been the discussion today. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us in studio. My name is Malaki Vilaudera. You've been told, pay your bills and in time. Stay here. Take Note is up next.